Speaking of calls to action, Davis, I'm going to ask you to come back up to the podium, if you might, and join us. We have what looks like to me about 19 minutes. Ladies, 19 minutes. Let's be clear, 19 minutes to entertain questions if you have some. Please, ma'am, stand in and share your question. Oh, very good. Thank you. Right here, right in front of me, black sweater. I've been doing this a long time, and sometimes I do get tired, so, you know, you guys. Um, but it seems to me, in my experience, and I remember the first time that I met Steve, it was at my first political action meeting in Manhattan, Kansas, with KPAC. Wow. Um, long time ago. Long time ago. Okay. Um, no, I didn't grit this gray hair for nothing. <laughs> and he lost all of his. So, um, but my question is, it seems to me in my experience in that when the dark money was able, when it was out there, it used to not be, it was the only, and, and now only the teachers have to put down who they work for or what they do, but um, once upon a time you had to say where you got your money from and whom, who donated to your campaign. But once the dark money was able, so is there anything out there that says we're going to do away with this dark money? That Steve wants to take a, a stab, and then maybe Davis has something to share. Hear me? Hear me? Okay. Uh, I have an admission to make. Uh, I serve on the board of two uh, dark money. CO4s. Uh, oh, yeah. okay. If you look in the uh, program, I'm on the Save Kansas Coalition, and I can tell you that uh, the Save Kansas Coalition collected money from friendly sources to uh, try to elect 12 representatives in the primary. We won eight, we lost four. And the other dark money group I'm on is the Kansas Vo uh, Values Institute, which is uh, Kathleen Sebelius' PAC. And uh, we get nationwide support, uh, just took a trip to Washington last week, to back good candidates. And I've been working uh, on Laura Kelly's campaign since before she announced. So there is dark money that's doing good things too. I understand that, but it's close for others. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, going back to my presentation, of We've got the people, they've got the money. It's gonna take pissed off women and pissed off young people to get their asses to the vote, to, to vote in November, well, and we'll right. win. Yeah. Well, all right. So, one, one major problem, and uh, I actually meant to mention this when I had the slide of how the partisan makeup of the legislature was, dark money really began, like the era that we're in now in 2010 because of Citizens United. This, most of this activity that we see today used to be illegal not that long ago. It was a 2010 case, and that's also, by the way, if it wasn't for dark money, I don't believe the tax experiment would have been possible. Dark money is what pushed candidates that were pretty undesirable on the communities that otherwise wouldn't have elected them. Now, that's a Supreme Court case, and unfortunately, until the Supreme Court overturns that, which is one of the most important national issues, I think, there isn't much that we can do. And I know that's like an unfortunate answer, but one issue that we face is a lot of times when people try to restrict money now, they actually end up restricting money that's in the light and just pushing even more money into the dark. So I know that's not an exciting answer, but really overturning Citizen United will be, is, is critical to getting dark money out of politics. Okay, I've got a question right here though. For a number of years, I've been aware of a procedure that's been going on in the state senate here in Kansas, and I was wondering if there's anything we can do to get rid of the gut and go. Question about gut and go. I mean, I could take, do you have opinions on this? Andy's got opinions on everything. 
So, uh, yeah. I mean, right, we could pass legislation. And there was actually uh, Representative Clayton from Johnson County. She pushed a lot of transparency legislation. But again, magically, it got pushed under the rug. Um, I think at one point, actually, there was an anti-gut-and-go bill that was gut and go into a bill. Um, but, I, I mean, again, it's, it's the legislative will. What, what we kind of saw there is the Kansas City Star did that great transparency article, and everyone was angry about it, and you heard some murmur, but then it just kind of fell off, and no one really pushed it. Um, I mean, I think 100% um, Ron Reichman and Susan Wagle should be held accountable. I mean, they are the reason that we did not end gut and go. This leg I mean, it is legislative leadership decides these things. That is just a policy change that they could make the decision to make that a priority, and that could end you know, the first day of next session if they wanted to. If I might add, we can get rid of gut and go. That doesn't replace citizen engagement. We can clean everything up, and that doesn't mean that we don't have to watch that building. So just, just to be clear, if we tighten all of those pieces up, we still need everything. And we have found ways in terms of watching, like a hawk, those committee processes to know when gut and go happens and then to work alternative measures. So, so I, I don't ever want us to rest in comfort when we think something has been fixed that we aren't still needed in that. We will always be needed to make Kansas the best state. That I am certain of, no matter how clean everything is, the process or limited money, we are still needed in, in democracy. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, and then I'll come over here. She's bringing you the mic. I'm talking about dark money. There is a film that we showed to packed houses twice last month in Wichita. It will be on public TV across the nation on October 1st, kind of late for us, <laughs> 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Across the nation, it's called dark money. I have copies of this, and I'd be willing to share. Dark Money is illustrated in that particular uh, film uh, 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 at, in the state of Montana, which has a hundred years of pollution that, uh, to which they addressed by incredible, strong, uh, uh, money uh, issues. It's a nice story. It can convince your relatives, <laughs> your friends, <laughs> your churchgoers. I heard another suggestion last night that we all acquire a copy of um, the film that we saw last night, The Best Democracy That Money Can Buy that we buy a copy of it, that we designate a night, and all have house parties. Again, to spread this basic information to folks who need it. Our relatives, <laughs> do you have relatives that need that? <laughs> our friends, our church, our rotary. Um, let me know if you want a copy of Dark Money, the film. Awesome, thank you. I'll come here, but we've been very patient here. Yes, ma'am. Nobody's ever called me patient before. <laughs> I think this is for Davis. I was told at, very recently by an activist who goes to Topeka a lot that citizens can, can write a bill yes. and get co-sponsors. Is that true? Yeah, so, I mean, you would, you could introduce a bill, um, so you could go to the committee and ask, like, here's a bill, and then someone in the committee could decide, like, oh, I'll take it up and allow it to be introduced. Um, I mean, again, this is where, I mean, e democracy is social, right? Everything we're talking about is just people, and you could meet a legislator there that maybe cares about the issue or someone on the committee and ask them to introduce it, um, but yeah, anyone can write a bill. What is great about Kansas too, and not every state has this, is we have a legislative research department, and we also have a reviser's office, so the reviser's office tries to make sure, tries to make sure that bills are clean and do what they're supposed to do. 
Um, and then the research office, you can actually utilize those tools. You can call the research department, you can call the revisor's office and present a policy you want and they can actually turn it into legal language for you. Uh, something not really utilized by people. But I definitely recommend trying to build a relationship with the legislator on the topic that cares about that so that they can introduce it because, uh, I mean, it's just a little more likely to make it through if you have a legislator pushing it. But yeah, you should never be afraid to go in and present your ideas or ask a legislator, why doesn't this happen? Because most committee, most folks, if you call them and they're on the committee, if they agree with you, they'll be like, that's a great idea. I'm going to call the revisers and get a bill written up on that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, so we all saw David's really shocking statistic of young people not voting and not even being registered to vote. Just to put a, a steep deadline on that, um, to Who register to vote, it ends 21 days before the election, meaning October 16th. Get your young people in your life registered to vote. October 16th. Yes. Um, I had another comment. Oh, it was based off something my sister has said. It is based on the idea that we have this idea that maybe our votes aren't that important. Why would people spend so much money trying to suppress our vote if our votes aren't important? Um, I, I want to make a quick comment on that 21-day deadline. And I'm not sure if Micah, I don't know if he's still here, um, and I don't know if you mentioned it earlier, but a lot of states now have election day registration. And so 21 days before, and this just happened when I was down in Pittsburgh, I ran into a 17-year-old girl who thought she wouldn't be able to vote this election because her birthday is before the election, but it's after the registration deadline. And I was like, no, 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 you're going to be 18. We can get you registered now. This woman almost forfeited her right to vote because of this misinformation out there. Also, every single election, thousands of 18, 19, 20-year-olds in Kansas go to the poll on election day and are told they cannot get registered there and vote and they still fill out the registration form so they get registered after but every day or every election thousands show up we have a solution it's called election day registration 18 year olds should be able to walk into the poll register to vote and vote on election day yes Um, you touched on the fact that a uh, legislator has to live on basically $20,000 a year. Now, that is set by the state legislature, is it not? Yes. And they cannot use campaign funds to support them. In theory. What, well, what else, what else can be done to allow certain segments of the population to be able to hold those kinds of jobs for us? I mean, pay a real wage. I mean, the other thing is like, our, our legislative system is set up for whenever we were, most legislators worked on the farm, they came in for a couple months to legislate and then they went back. It was never meant to be a full-time job because it was made when our legislature wasn't dealing with the problems that they're dealing with today. Right. The reality is, if you're a good legislator, it is a full-time job. If you're a good legislator, even on the off session, you're working with constituents, you're writing bills, you're studying this, you're involved. Um, like there's plenty of people who don't even earn that $20,000, but there's a lot of people who work their tails off and it's a year round job. So I think making it, I mean, this is an unpopular thing to say, but I think that we should at least pay, you know, $40,000. It should be a, a livable wage. I mean, we have Missouri pays about $40,000 to their legislators. Like, do we really want Missouri to beat us y'all? Thank you for your question. I'm going to I'll come back here. I'm going to go right back here. Speaking of the legislature and their salary, my bucket list is to travel to all 50 state capitals. And I have visited 42 of them at the moment. Uh, we have a legislature, House and Senate, that are, is way too big for the state of Kansas compared to others. If we cut each of the houses in half, we could pay that 40 thousand dollar salary oh, wow. but there's another thing that you need to remember the legislature the men and women who serve also get capers benefits that aren't the same as the rest of us their salary is annualized so if they're making twenty thousand dollars on 180 days it's really more like sixty or seventy thousand dollars. So that's what their capers benefits are. So those teachers in the room, I'm sure that you know what seventy thousand dollars 
would do for your CAPERS benefit if you're a retiree, or uh, county, city, state employees. That's an issue as well. Not that they don't deserve it. Well, some of them don't, uh, in my opinion. But those are some things that we could do as well. And I would just say really quickly on that, that again, I think this is part of the problem that the legislature has not been remotely proportional to age. That is a system set up for folks who are already retired. They're gonna be in the legislature a couple years, then they get all those benefits. Those long-term benefits are great, but if you're a 35-year-old with a young family, that doesn't help you to be in the legislature. Um, so again, it's designed for a certain type of legislator, not so much for young working families. I just, I just thought I would weigh in as somebody that served in the legislature. Um, so I'm 34, I'll be 35 in October, and I want to just kind of give you a sense of my reality. I first ran when I was 24 years old in 2008 and uh, I, against a seven-term incumbent, six-term incumbent. And I had to quit my job in order to run because my employer didn't allow somebody to run for or hold elected office. So that was a gamble on my part. Lost that election. Ran again in 2012, but the, the moment I had to make that decision was the day that the, the new legislative maps came out. And um, my wife and I were expecting Parker, that six-year-old I mentioned, uh, a month later. So uh, for me, serving in the legislature, even though I lived in Lawrence, I was 30 minutes away from the Capitol, it became the combination of having to manage a full-time job that I dialed back during the legislative session, being a good husband, being a good dad, uh, and giving all to a campaign and giving all to being a good policymaker for the state of Kansas. And that is a lot physically to manage, but mentally it's a lot to manage. So that was something for me that weighed into my decision to step down. And also, just to be totally candid, I, um, the partisanship within the legislature is frustrating for me. Uh, I, have, I had every license as a Democrat from Lawrence to be as fiery and progressive as possible, and yet um, the, some of the most authentic relationships I have are with conservative Republican lawmakers, and, and that's, why, that's why I wanted to chime in, is we will go nowhere as a state unless we sit around tables with people who think different from us. Uh, okay. Su su super important. Is it the easy way all the time? Not at all. But two things can exist at the same time. I can care about Dan Hawkins' health and his personal quest to lose weight. Uh, and I can also recognize he's making bad decisions when it comes to holding up Medicaid expansion. That doesn't make him a bad person. And it doesn't mean he won't be with me at some point on an issue that I care about. That's just one example. So two things can exist at the same time. And let's not write people off just because of a party affiliation. Thanks. Ladies, I know that there are additional questions that are out there, but I've been given the <laughs> cut it off mark. And if you know the women in charge of this, I need to um, <laughs> be in keeping with the standard. How about that? Um, I don't know about you, but my list got a little bit longer. Not only do I have a textbook to read, I have two movies to watch and a party to host. <laughs> Uh, some stuff that we got to get going. So um, I do want to take a moment of personal privilege and just thank you for allowing me to moderate this morning's session and for sharing with you this morning. I think we learned a lot together uh, and I'm, I am enthused and excited about the work that we're going to do as we leave this space. I've been invited to remind you lunch will be provided. There are lunch box lunches that are back in the East Hallway. We invite you to grab one, come back quickly because our program will resume at 1210 and you don't want to miss the opportunity to celebrate the heroines. And, the and oh yes, and I have a, a note that the list of attendees uh, here at today's conferences, which I'm, I'm hoping also includes those folks who have presented with us today, um, will be emailed to everyone electronically so that you will have email information to connect with your newfound friends. Thank you again so much morning. Let's have some food.